I actually learned this quote from Ice T, who's one of my favorites. He said, I never wanted to be the greatest. I just wanted to be in the conversation when people were talking about the greats. Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Hey, what's up? My name is Scotty Heath. I run Tank Crimes, which is a record label and also show promotions. Originally from San Francisco, then spent 20 years in Oakland, and I'm now located in what we're calling Parts Unknown, California, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. In addition to being the founder and, and runner of uh, Tank Crimes, you were also in the band Wojciech, right? I, I played in a band called Wojciech for like 12 or 13 years. We never officially broke up, but we haven't played in close to a decade, though the band group chat is still one of the most active things in on my phone. <laughs> so we're all still really close, but we're, we're spread across the country now and are much more just homies than bandmates at this point. Well, that makes me really happy because one of the last shows I saw before I left the U.S. in 2002 was Votsek played with my friends Balance of Terror at ABC Norio. And a couple of weeks later, I saw you guys at Gilman Street. And if I'm not mistaken, both shows were with Municipal Waste. Does that sound familiar? That's... <laughs> Dude, not only does that sound familiar, dude, that show at ABC No Rio is like a pivotal marker in my entire life that I talk about all the time. That's incredible. You were there. I had joined Votesec about three weeks prior to that show, and that was maybe our sixth show ever. And I didn't know the women in Votesec when I joined the band, but I'd never been on tour before. I was in my early 20s. Everyone in the band had was in their 30s, which made them seem super old to me in my <laughs> early 20s, you know? And so I joined this band with these older women and I didn't know what the vibe was going to be like or whatever. 
but I really wanted to take the opportunity. And Athena, our bass player, is the owner of Six Weeks Records, and they had just put out the Municipal Waste Crucial Unit Split, which was before their first album. And she had gave that to me at like our first band meeting. And when I joined the band, I was like, well, if I don't get along with these like la old ladies in votes, <laughs> like these municipal waste guys are my age. And it seems like it seems like I can like party with these guys and it'll all be fine. And it was the best of everything because. You know, I ended up playing with Votesec for like 13 years and that's, you know, family to me for sure. But even more important for what became my career, which wasn't even a hobby at that time, is meeting Municipal Waste that day right in front of ABC No Rio, meeting Tony and Ryan, who have become my best friends and we've traveled the world together and I, when, when Municipal Waste signed to Earache, I ended up joining on the road crew and I've done merch, I've guitar teched, I've drum teched, I've stage managed, I've tour managed, I've, I've done every job besides play an instrument in Municipal Waste, though I have played an instrument in some sound checks when somebody was running late. So it's like, but that, I always go back to A, making the choice to join VoteSec was one of the best choices I ever made. And that, I always go back to that day at ABC No Rio, just because it's like, you know, now I I'm, I'll be 46 years old next week. And Tony and Ryan, who I met that day, like 22 years ago, are still, I just was on the phone with Tony before, before you and I got on this thing. Like we worked together every single day and like visit each other. Our wives are friends. Like it's, it's really cool. So that's incredible that you were there. And then you were back in the Bay so that you like follow like, cause that tour, we drove all the way to New York really fast to meet municipal waste. And then we very slowly toured back to the West coast. Yeah. So I was, I was visiting somebody out in, in California. And so Athena, I believe it was, was a bass player. Yes. Correct. Yeah, and and so she mentioned that um, that you guys would be playing some shows in in the Bay Area, and since it coincided with, and you know, I'd, I'd never been to Gilman Street before, and so since it it coincided with my my trip out there, I, I figured I might as well uh, uh, see you guys play again. <laughs> well, that's so. What a fun way to start this podcast. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and you said you moved abroad shortly after, so twenty two years ago or whatever. Yeah, I'm in Malaysia. Oh, okay. I ended up uh, in Malaysia shortly after that. So those those were like the last gigs I ever I saw in in the states, and you know, uh, the ABC show would have been the last show I saw in New York um, for maybe like another like five six years. Yeah, you know, the only time I got to go to CBGBs was that night because we did the matinee at ABC. And then it was like Nihilistics and Hell Nation and Toxic Narcotic and Brody's Militia. They were all at CBGB's that night. That was the only time I ever got to go there. And so that was that's another like little personal trivia for that day for me. That was such a such a cool and important day in my life. I will totally de derail this from music just because I have a fun trivia fact about my life. My aunt and uncle were and my cousins were living abroad in Kuala Lumpur in the in the 80s and they were Saddam Hussein's hostages in Kuwait oh on that God. plane that was <laughs> on that plane that was going from New York City to Kuala Lumpur that's crazy so <laughs> we <laughs> we don't that's a whole podcast so we don't have to do that but that <laughs> is I can't I can't think of Malaysia without thinking like I was we had news cameras at my house every day when I was in like seventh grade. And like my mom and grandma would be like talking to the news, like talking about how, you know, like our, our family was hostages. <laughs> and my uncle, Ke Kevin Basner is his name, was actually the hostage that asked Saddam Hussein to let the women and children go. And he did. Saddam sent the women and children home, and my uncle remained hostage hostage for a while after that, before it was resolved. Which, of course, that all led to the Gulf War. So, 
wild. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, let's talk about music. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that Ten Crime specializes in, in any specific area of music? Any, any particular genre? Well, it started out and I was doing all local. It was Bay Area was really on like actually the whole hardcore was having that little boom, you know, in the early 2000s. And, and, and because each era is different, that boom was way different than the boom that like capital H hardcore is having right now. There just seemed to be this just so many bands popping up and it was still pretty cheap. Like, I mean, I was putting out we were uh, my first seven inches. We, they cost me like a dollar. 35 each to make and we'd wholesale them for two dollars and retail them for three dollars so the barrier of entry was really low then too so i was doing all bay area bands because i wanted to document the scene that i was a part of and i always knew that i never even even when i wasn't sure it was going to be like my career 20 years later, but even when it was a hobby, I knew I always just wanted to work with people that I knew personally because the value in it to me still, but from the very beginning was having a project to work on with friends that was bigger than drinking beer together or listening to music together, you know? So it was always Bay area and it was always punk, but I got metal. I got, 10 crimes termed metal just as the same way that like crossover and post hardcore originally happened. Like all my friends in hardcore bands just started getting better and better at their instruments and started moving into metal or like college rock type stuff, you know? And so I understand historically how that happened in the eighties because I watched it happen with my own friends. And now Tank Crimes is mostly a metal label. Most of the punk stuff I do is still on the metal side of punk, and it's more reissues of the punk stuff. The contemporary bands I'm working with are all metal. So, But I guess the theme there is that they all come from punk. Everything on Tank Crimes has a punk background and punk people in it, which, you know, that's not that's not some huge choice for me. It's just, it, it just, those are my values. That's who I am. And so that's who my friends are, you know? So I would say that's the underlining thing. It's all friends. And I, when I started working with bands from outside of the Bay area, that was just because I was touring so much. So, and I was playing in another band called deadfall and there was a couple summers there in a row where I would do full us tours with both Votesec and Deadfall. So I would be at a show, and these are all, you know, I mean, ABC No Rio and, and Gilman Street were like important venues we'd play, but we were playing a lot of basements and garages and VFW halls. And I mean, I never played a club until I'd already been like a legit club, not a dive bar until I'd been in a band, playing in bands for years, you know? Uh, some house parties too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like Votesec would do a 30 day tour and it would be 20 house parties, you know, <laughs> and we'd just be passing the hat, you know, to, for gas money. But I mean, everything we didn't have cell phone bills. Gas was under two dollars. Fucking it, it, there's just a lot of things that were that made it easy for us to tour like that all the time, you know. And so I started I would be like I could be like in Pittsburgh or St. Louis or something like staying the night at the punk house like hanging out with the bands from that town and be like all right guys like my band would be like okay thanks you guys you know hopefully see you soon and i would be like i'll see you guys in three weeks i'm playing this basement again you know like i would fly her for my next tour on tour stuff like that so that was so i started making lots of friends from all around and that's how tank crimes sort of grew out of the bay area because there was even some friends like municipal, municipal waste, for instance, that I was hanging out with more than my neighbors in Oakland. So I've spoken to a few people who, who run labels and the recurring story seems to be they started a label to, to release their own music and along the way, you know, either asked or were asked to release friends bands. Is that more or less what happened with Tank Crimes? Yeah, well, so the, the crazy 
thing about how Tank Crime started is I didn't put out the first record, but it was for my band. And so when I say that Tank Crime started out of necessity, the way a lot of hardcore and punk labels start like that to do your own band or your, or your friend's band, it kind of did. But what happened was we Deadfall got offered a seven inch by this guy named Bob Scammon, who I'm still friends with. He didn't have a record label. He was starting a record label called Control by Plague. And he invited us to be his first release. And we accepted and recorded a seven inch and turned in all the stuff. Now, Bob had Bob had money, like not big money, but he had some sort of like seasonal labor job that was maybe union, too. So he made really good money doing labor, but it was also seasonal. So he shows up one day at our house in the first tank crimes house in San Francisco and drops off eleven hundred seven inches for us and goes, here's your record, guys. I put it out. I'm going to go train and hopping all summer. I don't have to work for three months. <laughs> and we were like, oh, well, sick. But like, we thought you're a record label. He's like, I am. There's, there's my name's on the back. Here's your records. And we were like, he like kept one for himself. <laughs> it's so fucking crazy. Like no, no record label started like this. There's no fucking way. So we were gifted an entire pressing of a record. It's also crazy that in like 2003, a band that hadn't a local sloppy punk band that hadn't gone on tour would press a thousand seven inches. But that was like we sold them all in like less than a year. But it was like that that's would feel crazy right now if you were a new band doing your first record. But anyways, so we're like, well, shit, we're not actually on a record label. We just have a record out, you know, and I wanted I wanted distribution i i i wasn't really i, I didn't know if I, our record would be in stores but i definitely wanted it in like the seven inch boxes in the back of abc no rio and on a table in a basement in st louis and shit you know so i was always like the band dad you know so i kind of just took charge and was like i'll figure this out and it was actually Athena's husband at the time, Jeff Robinson from Capitalist Casualties and Six Weeks Records, who kind of mentored me early on and showed me like, oh, here's some places you can send your records for review because there was still, you know, I mean, Heart Attack, Slug and Lettuce, MRR, Profane Existence. Those were all still monthlies or quarterlies, you know. So and and some smaller zines and even some you know he gave me international places to send my records to Japan and stuff and then he gave me another list of people like oh here's some other labels that might want to trade records with you and stuff so right away I started distro because I'm trading the records and really small trades for like a new band like I was trading like I would usually trade six seven inches with someone and that way I could put five in my distro and keep one for myself and I really moved those 1107 inches through playing shows and trading records and then right away then i was the distro guy and i had this i would call it my old lady cart you know but can you picture like an old lady's like laundry cart or like recycled can cart not a full shopping cart but just kind of like a like more of a, a vertical one but anyways i would load that up with a couple boxes of records and one of the things I did early on, which really helped the label and it helped me network with a lot of people too, was I bought a one inch button machine and I started pressing out pins just, you know, I mean, just every fucking band I ever liked. And so that would bring a lot of people over to, you know, when you're selling like contemporary DIY seven inches, there's a lot of stuff that people don't know what it is, you know? And that was in the day where people would really want to talk to me about records and stuff. I always found it, it was really important for me to listen to everything that I had in the distro so I could, I could explain it to me. You know, I was like, not like a used car salesman or whatever, but if somebody asked about something, I wanted to know a reason why they should give me $3 for it, you know? But the one inch buttons that would really bring people over to the table, you know, just, you know, dead Kennedy's and circle jerks buttons and stuff. And even at the time I was getting really into is really obscure American and international hardcore too, as I was doing like a deep, I was doing a deeper dive 
and stuff. And so I would meet a ton of people that way. And I even met a lot of bands. Like if a band I liked was coming to town, I would just make like 50 buttons for them. And then I would go to the show and I would just give it to the band and just be like, Oh, I'm just a fan. Like <laughs> I just made you guys these buttons. Like it did what would cost me like fucking 10 bucks or whatever, you know? And I made like lifelong friends like that. And then another guy who ended up being like a mentor to me was Felix Havoc. And I met him by bringing Havoc records and nine shocks, terror buttons to a fucking backyard party in Oakland. They were at and was just like, Oh, Hey, I'm a big fan here's some buttons and stuff. And that, that really like, it was like an icebreaker to meet people. And then like what band doesn't like just getting like 50 free buttons to give away or sell for 50 cents or whatever, you know, like it was just like a really good way to start things off with people. And there's tons of people that I'm still friends with today. And people I ended up working with on the label that I met by doing that. So at, at the time that you were you were pressing the buttons, did you already have it in, in your head that you you wanted to to start up a label and, and release other people's music, or was it still just just the eleven hundred seven inches that you? No, I immediately. I'm glad you asked because that's important. I immediately loved it. As soon as we got those records, before I went to sleep that night. I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm the label. I'm going to do this. And then as soon as I started following the advice that other labels were giving me and it was working, I was just all in because it had only been a couple years since I had really found like the underground DIY punk. So it was kind of part of the trajectory, you know, like I went as soon as I found, you know, that bands were playing on the floor and didn't you didn't have to be good at an instrument which i was i still don't consider myself a musician or even a drummer i just kind of lucked out into the scene i found that you could play fast and and aggressively and kind of pull it off you know there also wasn't 50 phones pointed at me while i was playing sloppy <laughs> drums every night i didn't have to get like critiqued by strangers i've actually been had having that conversation recently with some friends like 
I don't know if I could have played in bands for so long if everything would have been online because some of the joy, and I'm glad to know that you were there at the time of seeing like bands that weren't technically proficient, but they were fun. You know, there was a lot of that and you really have to like be in the moment to enjoy just like a sloppy fun band in a basement. And not that people are outside of the moment now, but certainly everything is being way over documented by everyone and stuff like that. And people are fucking mean on the internet. So I don't know. I don't, I would have lost a lot of confidence if there was a million, you know, like this was pre YouTube, let alone pre social media. So the funny thing about that era and, you know, in terms of documenting, I actually do have photos from that night. So I'll, I'll dig them up and see if I can send them to you. Oh, incredible. Would love to see them. Yeah. But the funny thing about that 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 era was, you know, a band like Municipal Waste are, are huge now. But at the time, I don't remember us thinking, oh, this is special. This is going to be, you know, it was like, oh, you know, these these guys are doing like a like an old school crossover kind of thing. Oh, that's that's kind of fun. Yeah, it was just cool. It was like, yeah. oh, cool, because this band's doing like the D beat thing and these guys are doing this style. And it's like. Oh, this is super fun. These guys are doing like DRI beer bong shit. This is great. This really adds to the to the party we're throwing here, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. People weren't people weren't in basements going, this is going to be the biggest thing in metal in 20 years or whatever, you know, like Yeah. Certainly the guys didn't think they were starting a career, you know. And it's funny cuz I, you know, I every so often I'll, I'll mention something like you know, when I saw Catharsis or when I saw Electric Wizard or something, and there were like, you know, 50 other people in the room, you know, nobody cared. And like everyone, you know, especially nowadays, like that these bands are considered legendary. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm lying. And I'm like, like literally you showed up to a show on a Tuesday night. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was it. Like you have to be interested enough to show up. That was it. Like we didn't think that we were watching history being made or that you know oh this band is going to be huge or whatever it was just like oh you know there's there's something going on you know let's go let's go check it out yeah it didn't matter much to me what bands were playing there were certainly bands i would get more excited about or less excited about but when every show was five bucks and every you knew there was going to be you know a group of friends there that you could that you got along with and stuff there's a hundred shows or more I went to where I didn't even know who the band, you know, that's why you, I discovered so much new music at that time. And punk is so fleeting, like a lot of stuff, you really just have to be there to experience it. And it's gone. I mean, that even includes a lot of my early releases. Like I they just like, if you weren't there, I, it, it, I'm not sure how it could be that meaningful to you with a million bands, you know, but it was definitely that vibe. You know, I, I was going out to be part of a community and then I'm like, that, that's what else I didn't realize was that starting tank crimes. It was like hustling buttons and hustling seven inches didn't feel like I was going out for my job or something, you know, but I slowly and slowly was able to work less and less if I hustled more and more selling stuff at shows you know at which i always thought was like reasonably priced and i was making tons of friends and i was doing you know like it just worked it just worked with the attitude i brought towards towards the whole thing well you, you mentioned wanting to document the scene i mean on some level you must have known that you know what was happening was was special that even if it was just your own youth or your own experiences Oh yeah, I definitely think I I definitely thought something special was happening, but I think that anyone could get that feeling if you're playing in bands and making lots. You know, like I had that feeling something special was happening, but that was because there was like a hundred people interested. You know, and all that stuff is like kind of lost into like the fabric of time and punk history now. It's not what I thought was so special at the time is not being discussed that much to these days, unless somebody asked me about it, you know, that doesn't take away the importance, but it was really just how I felt inside. But I think people all over the country and all over the world can get that feeling all the time. You know, it's just a, a different kind of person wants to participate more, you know, and that was really my thing. Well, I mean, how, how much of it was, was, 
being in the Bay Area where I think historically. Oh, that made it so easy. Like that, that's like, a, that was like a privilege for punks for sure. Because, you know, we got, we're, we're, we got friends in Des Moines, Iowa, and they don't get, they don't have coverage from maximum rock and roll being broadcast to the entire international scene monthly. You know, it was like, we had prank records, six, two, five, six weeks, maximum rock and roll. It, you know, slap a ham had just kind of folded up and moved to LA right as I was kind of getting on the scene or whatever. But there was that, you know, we were kind of, there was like the fumes of what was the original West coast power violence scene had kind of like was had kind of all those bands had kind of moved on. And there was a new, there was kind of a new thing going this resurgence of like 80s style hardcore, which is really what I like popped out of, you know, but yeah, it was definitely Bay area punks are privileged, you know, looking at other things in because all eyes are on the Bay. So, I mean, I think I, I, I talked about what I was able to do with my limited musical capabilities and I'm, there was probably people that in other scenes who looked at us and some of the other bands and might've thought that we didn't deserve all that we got or that they deserved it more. And that was, I don't, I don't, that doesn't keep me up at night, but that was not our fault or their fault. It, it really was location, you know? I mean, something else that I think you had experience with or access to as you were touring was, you know, as you were going from city to city, state to state, you were meeting the distros or the kid who had his own distro, record labels, uh, sometimes attached to venues. Were all those contacts uh, useful when you started setting up tank crimes and um, soliciting orders and stuff like that? Yeah, well, here's the thing is that in a scene of 100 kids, there's usually two or three people doing all the work. Yeah. And that's just how everything works, right? So usually the same person doing the seven inch distro is also the same person who hooked up the show, or it's like their roommates or something, you know? Like there's like, this sounds gross, but there's like consolidation of power everywhere right and it's like that's not what i mean really when i'm talking about punk but it's like there's usually like two to five movers and shakers and they're all usually really tight or maybe there's two factions that don't like each other but they're both the ones doing everything but it's still like six people or less so yeah absolutely you know and going on tour with vote sec because everyone in the band already had all this touring experience and they had all been active in diy in the 90s we're like staying with like we're end up crashing with Felix Havoc with Al from the pissed with Ken from sound pollution and hell nation. So it's not only am I meeting like the kids that are kind of like starting out like I am, I'm like crashing out on the couch of like who to me are like the OGs at that point, you know? Right. Yeah. And the other thing that that reminds me is, you know, one of the reasons I knew right away I wanted to do the label, it was just so common for everyone to do a label. Like there was so many more labels. So it didn't feel like a stretch really at all to do it. You know, like all, all the people that I thought were, you know, I wanted to be someone that was participating more than the average, you know, mosh pitter was that the people that I admired in the scene we're all people that were booking the shows and had their own labels. And it's like, even like all the bands I ended up reissuing right now, like with dystopia, like Mao's had life is abuse. Like I'm like meeting like some of like the older, like some of my scene elders at the time, which now that we're all older, we all feel the same age. But when they were like seven years older than me, when I was in my early twenties, they felt a lot older and they certainly had a lot more experience than me. Yeah. But it was like Mouse had life as abuse. Dodge had slap a ham. Max had six two five. My bandmate Athena owned, ran six weeks with her husband at the time. Like it just felt like, oh, these are the people that these are like the people that do shit. I want to be someone that do shit. Like they all do record labels. Like it doesn't. And, and like I said, I mean, a thousand dollars was a ton of money me, to me at the time. But I could I could save it up if I worked. 
and and then put out another record or you know yeah so i really so it really and and all that that also goes back to the bay area because if you weren't in the bay area you weren't just like at a diy show in the back of a, a in the back of a record store or in a warehouse and there's like five people that own important record labels in the room with you you know that i can just go fucking bother <laughs> you know or like I said, or that I can offer 50 free buttons to as a way to like massage my friendship and instead of just being a punisher, right? the economics of of running the label uh, you know you and I are are close close in age and I think we come from a time when ownership of music really meant being tied to a physical release yes in order in order to hear something you had to buy a CD or a cassette or you know vinyl and one of, one of the reasons why zines were so crucial and important, because if you were going to part with your 10 to $20, you know, I mean, we all took leaps of faith on cool artwork and stuff like that. But music journalism, even at the DIY level, was so much more important because everyone had to, you know, open up their pocketbook to, to get another, another piece of music. That's exactly right. Someone, someone could give a, a record a, a 10 out of 10, but... This was this was an era where you couldn't just like pull out your phone and, and check out an album, right? Like you had to you had to guess based on that person's taste in music and, and what they liked, whether or not it would match with your own taste in music, and whether or not you know <laughs> you were willing to shell out you know twelve dollars, fifteen dollars, or whatever for you know to, to mail order a CD and then wait three weeks to hear it. <laughs> yeah, it was 
several several leaps of faith in order to to be a music fan in those days well you know what's funny is that i said earlier that you know i always like to know i like to be able to describe all the records in my distro when i was talking to kids at the, you know at, at, at the at just at the merch table at shows but what i would also do is we used to host tons of bands too so there would uh, there would like few easily three to six times a month uh, there'd be a band or two crashing at my house right but also what would happen was there'd be there was a be a lot more late nights of sharing music because because of that because of what you're talking about so if you'd get back and start dr and drinking some beers and stuff but a lot of that would be revolved around you'd be in the record player room at whatever house you're at or certainly at my house or whatever and you're just playing music and you'd be playing a lot of new music and one of the things that like it's talking about being a used car salesman or something, but this was always funny and we would always laugh our asses off after what happened. If I had a sick new record in my distro, like I said, I would always keep a personal copy. So I would just be excited about a record and I'd be like, oh shit, did you guys hear this one? And I'd put it on and then there's five people crashing at my house and they all want one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh sweet. <laughs> I got them, <laughs> you know? So I would definitely like sell records late night at parties just from playing music and sharing music with friends, you know? Well, that was the funny thing. I mean, I mentioned my friend's Balance of Terror. My friend Stan played guitar in that band. And, you know, I'd never heard of M Municipal Waste before. You know, M Municipal Waste and Wojtek played with uh, my friend's band. Yeah, Balance of Terror was my very first show, my first two shows with Wojtek, because they had already been a bit, they already had a seven inch out when I joined the band. Um, and it had been a band for like a year or more. And I was actually their third drummer. But then I stayed in the band until until we stopped. Or now it's just a group chat, like I said. But Balance, we played our first show at our friend Negative Tom's basement with Balance and Terror. And we played our second show at the Mission Street BART station, which was a cool place. They'd have shows. There was just literally a plug on the light post at the train station in the mission district of San Francisco. And we would just fucking plug in and play until, until the cops came or, and sometimes the cops would just watch because it was kind of a gritty neighborhood and it was like fun. And like people would come, you know, it would be like 50 punks would show up and then it would just kind of like the neighborhood would kind of gravitate over to it. But that was also with balance of terror. Yep. I actually just heard Stan's new band. His latest band. I just I just listened to them. Is it called Arctic Flowers? No, po like new, new. Oh wow! Like he's doing something brand new. I just like it was just an. I can't rem even remember what it's called because I'm like on the spot. <laughs> but there was they were featured on a blog I really like, No Echo, and yeah, it's fucking stands in there. So that's awesome. I'm 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 really glad that he's uh he's still he's still making music. Stan was a good dude. We were always partying with Signal Loss too, like a lot. Yeah. In those years, you know. Yeah, I mean, because Stan was was touring and playing shows and really connected to the scene, you know, he was the guy who was like, you know, like like I said, I'd, I'd never heard of Municipal Waste before he played with, or before, yeah, before Balance of Terror played with you guys, and uh, and Municipal Waste, and then you know the first time I heard from Ashes Rise and Tragedy. It was a cassette that Stan gave me. Yeah. He was like, oh, you like his heroes gone. You should check out these guys. Well, because Stan was in Death Threat with some of those guys, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, that was a great. That was like the skateboarding version of Tragedy. Death Threat was fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but I mean, from going on tour, you must have been seeing like all this stuff popping up and, and getting a sense of like, oh, you know, these guys from like Virginia who nobody knows about are, are about to become the next big thing. Yeah. And I didn't think that. And it's crazy because so much was popping off then. But like I alluded to earlier, like it's really like not that like the early years of Tank Crimes is some of the most least talked about eras of music right now. Like there might be a time when people when when there's some interest coming back, but also a lot of bands then were like playing like a, a throwback retro style. So I don't know, like if that style music comes back 
I don't know if people look towards the bands from the early 2000s or if they just look back to the bands from the 80s and 90s that those bands were emulating. Right, right. It, it's it's hard to say. So we'll see. I don't I don't I don't have a chip on my shoulder about that, but I just I just find that like the, a lot of people, a lot of my new fans that find tank crimes either through dystopia or through through like metal they don't know what the fuck i was doing for the first 10 years at all you know <laughs> and a lot of that stuff because i said like punk is fleeting like a lot of those bands if you weren't there a lot of my records are like in the digital dollar bin which is fine but i can always point people to records that have been out of print for me for years you can find on discogs for a few dollars if anybody wanted to do a deep dive on my catalog the the shipping might cost you more money than than my first 20 releases <laughs> well let, let's talk about the physical releases i, I sort of <laughs> sort of had an old man moment and and we did a zigzag. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I took us back to my box distro, right? When we were going to talk about streaming and phys versus physical. <laughs> yeah, right. So in, in, in those early days, were you, were you able to break even on, on all the, all the records? No, I was able to break even by doing all the other stuff that went with it. It was like, you couldn't just put out a seven inch. You had to put out a seven inch, have a button distro, have a seven inch distro book shows, which I wasn't taking any money off those shows, but it kind of like, here's another dirty word, but it upped my like social capital in the scene by being a promoter. And that also let, let more people like gravitate towards what I was doing, you know? And so it wasn't, I was still, I was still hustling a lot. And, but then I started bootlegging t-shirts too, which, you know, way different than now. We weren't taking pre-orders on Instagram for $35 direct to garment t-shirts or whatever shit I deal with all the time now with dystopia. But I would just screen print shirts in my garage and it was just something I added to my distro. I had a, I just had a bucket that I would put like 20 different shirts and I would just buy t-shirts at the thrift store and flip them inside out screen like fucking discharge on it or something and just underneath the table where my records were would be a bucket and i'd put a little sign that said dig five bucks and you know so it was like always just adding it really is like <laughs> i mean capitalism's a motherfucker but i just kept needing more shit to sell was really what i needed and so you'd, you'd add something here, you'd add something there. Then, you know, it was a while before I even graduated to doing LPs and CDs. And a lot of that was because I was pushing this cart everywhere and I'd have to take it on the bus. I mean, if I was going from San Francisco to Burnt Ramen was a club in Richmond, I would have to take two buses and a BART train with this fucking cart. So like LPs were discouraging to me because they were heavy and big and it was like harder for me to like to work with them because i didn't it, there was no online store i had to take my records to the people you know so and then but i got a really a job that ended up being super important to the label right around like by the labels already going and stuff but miles from dystopia and life is abuse was opening his screen print shop and it's not a t-shirt screen printing shop he does like fine art and gig posters and stuff it's all paper screen printing and really high-end beautiful stuff and he still runs that business called monolith press now it's and it's just a, a really cool place but i started when he bought his first press i was super interested in screen printing and i had just done like one color t-shirts in my garage and stuff but i was really into the process. And so I started volunteering to help him out just for like beer and dinner while he was starting the business. And then I ended up being the first and only employee for a couple years. And that was really cool because I could always go on tour and work there. And that ended up being my last real job. But I worked there for a few years and that was what I could work enough hours at Mouse's shop to make sure that things like rent was paid and I had like food and beer money, like, which was like my, my entertainment budget or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> right. and so I always, for years, I always had a separate job, but it was complimentary to what I was doing with tank crimes. 
that that covered the the hard expenses and then i always just kind of made it work when i started getting into i don't want to derail us too much but i did then a couple years later found myself in quite a bit of debt because i started approaching full albums the way i did as i was watching the bands i was working with grow there's like this mid period of the label like 2010 era which is when a lot of people kind of when i got on a lot of people's radar outside of the of the basement diy scene i was starting to do lps and cd's and that was just like a whole bigger expense and i ended up in quite a bit of debt and that's when i started professionally growing medical marijuana <laughs> up in the area where i live now and i did that for 3 summers until actually the last year i grew pot was the year oh uh, it was devastating we're all sitting it was election year 2016 and fucking trump won and pot got legalized in the same fucking night <laughs> I had like three trimmers out at my spot and they were all we they were all already making a set amount of money based on like how much we were going to sell all the weed for. And the easiest way to explain it is a pound of outdoor weed in California the day before the election was worth about 1200 bucks and a pound of outdoor California weed the day after weed got legalized went to about $400. Oh wow. And it costs about 2 it costs about $250 to grow a pound of weed. So <laughs> I just slunk out of the business and it was a rough third season, but what happened, it was still a great choice because a I still grow weed as a hobby and I love it. I found I spent these three summers out here in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas where I now live because over the pandemic I started getting like hungry to be back out in the outdoors again like being stuck in the city was was rough for everybody but I was like oh you know I I had just spent these summers in this this big open space out here in the foothills so that kind of brought me here but the years when I when I when I made money growing pot those paid off all my debt and what i was able to do and this is crucial was it was like i was able to get a fresh start on the label a- around 2015 but also with 10 years of experience you know so it was like i had already made all these dumb moves and if and if somebody who wasn't as bold that would want to just go live out in a trailer and grow pot all summer like i could have just folded at any time and just like gone back to screen printing or if it's off there was something else i want to do i don't know but i really just believed in what i was doing and and really thought that if i could just get over this monetary hump that i could get things going again and it really didn't slow down the label at all like outsiders didn't notice i had just slowed down in like 2015 i only did like two releases and that was just like my slow year and then i i made a bunch of money and you know you grow weed i had like a medical marijuana growers license but most of the weed that i did grow would end up getting sold on the black market just cuz the way the nature of the pot business and so i would work all summer and not get paid you you get you know so it's it's a big investment just to be out here i mean it, it's it's farming right you got you got paid uh when when the harvest is in and when you sell it yeah exactly you get paid after harvest yeah. you know but you got it with you want to grow i mean i was growing you know an outdoor california plant i was growing like 14 15 foot cannabis plants like 100 of them and each each plant like a 15 foot cannabis plant will yield like 5 pounds of weed 5 pounds of sellable bud. And so, I mean it was an insane amount of work, but I would get paid in cash in around Thanksgiving every year. So I was able to pay off all those debts and start fresh. And that was really like kind of I don't know how I would divide the last like 22 years into eras or whatever, but that was a crucial time. You know, 2015 I kind of buckled down to do that. and then by 
2017, that's kind of like what Tank Crimes is now, which is like a reissue and metal, a punk reissue and contemporary metal label. I think one one other big thing happened in that span of time as well, which was, you know, smartphones and streaming apps. And, you know, for for people like you and me, you know, we would buy CDs, we would buy records, and that's how we listen to music. I think for people 15, 20 years younger than us, you know, the first thing they'll do if they hear about a band is go to YouTube, go to Spotify. Yeah. I mean, you can click play. You don't need to read a review when you can click play and assess for yourself if you like it, you know? If you've got ears, you don't need eyes. You're listening to music, so. For, for as much as vinyl was kind of a, a nerdy collector thing, even when I was buying music, now, you know, when I get press releases from, from labels, sometimes it's like 10, 15 variations of a, a record. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, it's nuts. And I'm guilty of it myself. Yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> nuts. You know, one thing that's really different about all the many variants is like in the early 2000s, it would be like first press all on black, like second press on red, third press on blue. Like it would usually be like a lot of records had to like get repressed to get on color. Or if there was color, it would be like 100 on red, 900 on black or whatever. And a lot of the like as we got into like internet commerce and stuff and a lot of the early days of ebay 
was all about records that would sell out and be worth so much more just the very next day. I think from where I'm at, we're past that. Like, and that's the thing. Like if I do seven vinyl variants, if one sells out, everyone just moves on to the next one. And I don't see the one that sold out like double in value on Discogs or eBay the next day. Everyone just keeps moving along and there's much less interest in the pressing numbers. It used to be very much like, oh, I want the most limited one. And now I find a lot of times people just want the one that they think looks the coolest, which is which is fine by me, you know? So when I'm doing multivariance, my head is not at like, ooh, this one can be super limited. We'll sell it out the first day. It'll create hype. It'll it'll double in value in the in the in the resale market or whatever. I'm really just thinking like, oh, what what will look really cool and really complement this package? So the people that do spend their money on my records will just be really stoked every time they they pull it out and open it up because you know, we made that little extra step to put a little bit more value into the package. So in, in this current era where, you know, people can, or, you know, let's take it from, from two sides. An artist can record his music on his laptop, you know, upload it immediately to Bandcamp and, you know, presumably Spotify and YouTube music or whatever. And on the other side, you have a consumer who can, you know, go directly to a streaming app and, you know, not have to go through a record co- record store, not have to go through a mail order, not have to read a review in a zine. Maybe they'll, they'll read about it on Reddit or something like that. But, you know, the artist and the consumer can now interact with each other directly. What is the role of, of the record company? There's there's two main thing, or excuse me, three main things that I think a record label does right now. A is a record label can give you money. A record label, whether that's money to record, and money for mastering, money to help with the art, but most importantly, money to press vinyl is really what a band wants out of a record label. That's an expense that's usually a bit too far for a band, right? So there's money. Then there's distribution. As much as people have access to music, bands want their records in stores. It's very important. And when a band goes on tour, they usually stop at record stores. You know, that's usually something to do to waste some time in the afternoon before the show or before load in or after sound check or whatever. Bands get fucking bummed when they're out there working and they don't see their records anywhere. You know, that's that's hard for a band, especially when you're just like getting by on tour and it, it can just feel like, oh, man, does anyone even care or whatever? So being in stores is still really important to band. I mean, it's important to me, but as a band, they want their records in stores and that's getting distribution uh, uh, and a, a good distribution that actually pays. That was one of the biggest challenges that I ever had. And I, I, I got burned a bunch before I was in a comfortable spot. So we have the record label has money. The record label has distribution. And then the third thing that the record label has, both as a tastemaker and as someone who's been in the industry, is influence. And I don't mean that in a dirty way, but... They know people at the magazines. They are friends with other labels. They know a lot of other bands. They know show promoters. And they, you know, if they're doing their job, they've got they've got a nice social media following. They 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 have fans that have already trusted the record label with other music. So when the record label says, here's the next band I'm gonna work with, there's already ears ready to to listen. So I think money, distribution, and influence amongst fans and the behind the scenes, the the the, the industry part of of this. If you're trying to grow your band, and you know, if and especially if you want to make it your career. I mean, when when I was a kid, you know, when I say kid, I mean you know, in high school. Yeah. If it had that earache logo on it, I had to get it. You know what I mean? Like I had to own it. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and there's still, 
you know, it's really important to me to be like, I never want, I actually learned this quote from Ice T, who's one of my favorites. He said, I never wanted to be the greatest. I just wanted to be in the conversation when people were talking about the greats, you know? So that's kind of how I look at the label. I don't want to be the number one label in the world, but I want to work hard enough that I'm always in the conversation with the other greats and really have that, that again, dirty words, brand recognition for, I always apologize when I say industry terms because I come from the DIY basement that recognition just to build a following, you know, I like to give, I'd like to hope that tank crimes gives value to the bands that I work with as much as their art and music gives value back to the label. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke with, with Tom Hazelmeyer from Amphetamine Reptile and, you know, we're good, you know, whatever it is, 30 years or more from the days when. Yeah. What a cool label. But when it was like the am rep sound was it was a popular hot hot thing yeah 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 but i mean you know today's the day helmet unsane like ridiculous the the bands that he uncovered and and brought to the world and i think am rep is always going to have this cool factor where if a band like mr flies comes out maybe you'll be interested in a new noise rock band maybe you won't but if you find out they're on am rep it's like oh well now i have to listen to it right yeah. And like some things, once you, once you make that mark, you can't even destroy it. You know, you brought up earache and now earache is like a dad rock label. <laughs> and so, I mean, they just straight up are, I mean, I think Digby would agree he's a dad rock label, you know, and they, they invest a lot of energy into that scene, you know? So, but that doesn't take away the feeling that you or I get about the early catalog, you know, like, if you make a big enough mark, you can't even destroy it. You know, they're just basically doing something else now. They're just doing something completely different. And I, it seems like they're even making their mark with that scene. I just have no interest in it, but I still, but, but that didn't change the importance of not just the sound that they were documenting, but just the importance of that brand. I mean, to a certain extent, labels like tan crimes and, Transylvanian recordings or, you know, Everlasting Spew. These small independent labels are doing the work that the zines used to do in terms of finding the next, you know, I don't want to say the next big thing, but finding like the cool stuff that like people like me would 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 get excited about. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know, they're on tank crimes. Yeah, well there's there's a lot of curation involved in what I do, and I do that with the with the records that aren't on tank crimes that I sell in my store too. You know, I like to think that I'm like if you trust tank crimes, what I've released, you can kind of, you could blindly pick something out of my distro and, and trust it. You know, like I, I think I could have like a nine out of 10 match with somebody who already likes the records that I put out if they would started buying stuff out of the distributed titles that I, that I carry. And so you said that even in the early days, it, it wasn't just the records that that selling the records that you needed to break even, it was all the other stuff that you're doing in relation to the label. You know, in, in this age where people are desensitized from actually paying for music, is that more true than ever? I don't entirely see it that way, but that's just out of my experience. And I know it's other people's experience. We still do, we still, on a good month, we sell way more physical product than our income from streaming, especially if there's new releases on a bad month for on a bad month for like sales. We're at about even about 50, 50 streaming revenue versus physical. But most of the time we're doing much better with physical. And I just feel like I'm really tapped into to real music collectors that, that really want it. And I've seen, you know, the scene was really aging. And one thing that the pandemic did that was positive in my world is that a bunch of teenagers got into punk and metal again. And I felt like the scene was really aging. I really remember being on tour in like 2018 and 2019 and just being like, man, I'm, I'm 40. And I'm like the, I'm like not just the medium age, but like, there's not a lot of people younger than me, especially in Europe. 
And it just really felt like we were a like the scene was aging and there was no new blood. And, and I didn't, you know, and all these people were predicting like, Oh, Trump's going to come back and punk's going to get huge again or whatever. And <laughs> that just didn't, you know, that kind of happened with George W. Bush, you know, like the, the Iraq war and George Bush really kind of fueled punk for a few years there. But after we were in the full on phone age, it, there wasn't that much, you know, but what happened was, the pandemic put everyone on their phones for a full year sitting on their couch and people were really ready to come out and do stuff once it ended and like shows are bigger. But most importantly to me is that I have teenage fans again and I'm talking to teenagers on social media and at, you know, they're asking me about records and stuff like that. And I definitely, I'm talking to kids who are like starting their vinyl collection with like a couple records from tank crimes and stuff like that. And so that's really cool because what I see from my end is that physical is not going to go away at all. I know people talk about the vinyl boom that's been happening or whatever. And Taylor Swift can move a million, 12 inches, but it's always going to kind of wax and wane, you know, and it depends on which bands are popular and which labels are popular and how they really push what they're doing. But I think that I'm tapped into 10 crimes. Isn't something you find out about on your first day of being interested in extreme music. It's it kind of, you got to dig a little bit before you get to me. Right. So I feel like those people are the kind of people that do want to own something and I feel like a lot of my fans actually do buy the record and listen to it at home, but also subscribe to a streaming service and listen to the records that they own physically. They also listen to them, not via download card, but just via a streaming app in their car and on their headphones.
So speaking of going to shows again, 10 Crimes is organizing the Brain Squeeze tour, which will have a few people who've been on this podcast. Do you want to tell people about that tour? Yeah. So the Brain Squeeze tour is finally happening. The 10 Crimes Brain Squeeze was a festival. I put on two of them over the years and in Oakland. And there was actually was a 10 Crimes Brain Squeeze 3 was planned for September 2020. And we never even got to announce it, which not announcing it was probably easier than having to cancel it outwards. But I would have loved to see the flyer, you know, but we didn't get there. And then all these years later, Municipal Waste is putting together this a, a tour and it just kind of slowly happened. Like they they knew Necrot was going to do a new record this year. So they called Necrot. Necrot confirmed for the tour. OK, they're still just like piecing it together. Municipal Waste has asked Ghoul on tour like 10 fucking times like so many times i was surprised they were still asking because ghoul for whatever reason could never ever confirm a municipal waste tour and this time they did so tony calls me and was like dude i got ghoul and necrot confirmed on the waste tour and before he could even say it i was like oh shit are we doing a brain squeeze tour and he was like we're doing a brain squeeze tour. <laughs> and I had just hooked up with dead heat and dead heat. I met because they came out on tour with municipal waste in right after it was actually a really weird tour because it was in 2021. It was like the very, it was like right when touring reopened, like we all had to like show our vax cards to like load into venues and shit. It was a really weird time. And the, Shows were super weird because tons of people still weren't comfortable coming out and it, everyone was still masked up and stuff. It was just, it was, it was a weird time, but that's how I met dead heat. And I really vibed with those kids. And then we ended up doing this EP together and Tony was just like, oh, I'm going to call dead heat. Let's see if they'll, let's see if they'll do it. And boom, it just came together like that. So brain squeeze is a tank crimes thing, but municipal waste have always been involved in the brain squeeze and they really put together this tour and almost surprised me with it, you know? And then, of course, you know, I want to be a valuable asset to that by marketing the tour with all that I've got. A, because it promotes, you know, uh, Ghoul and Necrot are the most active and highest selling active bands on the label, you know? And so even just having Ghoul and Necrot together is is really great for me because a label this size it's really hard to put bands together because some if not all the members of the bands are still working other side jobs and stuff like that and everyone can't get together at the same time so ghoul and necrot alone would have been so great for the label but then to be supporting municipal waste which is such an important band for tank crimes and then now we're playing in like i mean it's all big venues you know i mean it's mostly thousand cap rooms so that's just incredible. I can't believe the label finally has a tour and it's like big fucking clubs, you know? So it's just really cool. And we got a ghoul EP out in time and I'm, I've been towing the line on talking too much about it, but we've definitely leaked that there's a Necrot album coming and we'll, we'll be making some noise about that soon. And certainly when they're on the road and stuff, people will know what's coming from Necrot. So very cool. it's just really exciting. It's one of those things that I wasn't sure I was ever going to be able to put together. And then I didn't put it together. <laughs> My best friends did and like gifted it to me. So it's really exciting. And it's kind of like a dream come true for a label to have like a label, kind of a label showcase tour, you know? Very cool. So by the time people hear this podcast, the Ghoul EP will be out. You already released the Dead Heat EP, and the tour will be about to start. If people want to get updates on what's happening with the label and future releases, as well as get tour dates for the Brain Squeeze tour, what's the best way to do that? You can find me on all social media, though I'm most active on Instagram and sometimes Twitter, but not Facebook. And that's all at Tank Crimes. And what's great about having had made up a word or taking two words and smushing them into one word with no meaning, like I did when I named Tank Crimes, is that if you can just remember the name Tank Crimes and you plug that into your phone, you will find me. There is no one else. 
<laughs> to, there is no one else that Google will search for you than tank crimes. And, and I'm pretty active on social media. You know, I try to, I try to be on there. You know, I try to post like three, four times a week and check my comments and messages every day. So, so people can find me there. SEO baby. And uh, yeah. And all that stuff. And all the tickets for the tour, you can find direct ticket links for everything on the tour. And there's a link and I add all my social media sites and at tankcrimes.com, but that's at municipalwaste.net is the municipal waste website. And right on their front page, they have more info and direct ticket links to every single show. So, and some shows have sold out. And if this is coming out in two weeks, that's getting even closer to the, to the time. So it's really, it's really time to get out there and buy a ticket too. If you're coming out to a show, because uh, as the dates get closer, less and less become available. And like I said, we've sold out a couple shows already, which is really exciting. And what's the best way to, to support tank crimes? If people want to buy music, <laughs> The be the best way to support. I know it's a, it's it's a crazy it's a crazy idea, but some people still do it. Oh yeah, no. Well, we sell T-shirts too, so <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> but the best way to support Tank Crimes is to follow us on social media, and the easiest way is to just tell your friends about us and maybe share some of our stuff in social media. That doesn't cost you a dime. You can stream our music is on all streaming services. And we do have a band camp as well. If that's your bag, though, I find that people purchasing MP3s is purchasing digital music for their digital collection seems to be dying more and more. I feel like band camp like helped that over the line after iTunes went away, but I'm, I'm finding band camp to be, shrinking in its reach at least it from from my perspective but if you buy an lp and stream it on spotify when you're not at home in front of your turntable that really helps us out that really helps us out and but my biggest mission is awareness of the bands more than money coming in because they kind of go together so i really ask the fans to just talk about our bands listen to our bands come out to the shows because everything just kind of works out from there. If everybody's talking about the bands, things will be just fine here at Tank Crimes. And Tank Crimes also has a, a merch table page, right? For people who want to buy physical leases and t-shirts and stuff like that. Yeah, you can find the link at tankcrimes.com, but the direct link to our store, we work with a great company out of Lawrence, Kansas called Merch Table. So it's tankcrimes.merchtable.com. And they handle all our mail order and they do and the web store and they do a great job. And honestly, when I partnered up with them, it gave me my life back because there was a time when I was packing mail order till two, three in the morning, every single night. And when I finally reached the volume of sales where it made sense to outsource to another company, it really let me focus on helping the bands grow and helping the label grow, not just getting the record to everyone on time, you know? So that was actually a huge move for me. And I love Merch Table and they do a way better job than I ever did. They, uh, they even have a customer service phone number you can call if you're wondering <laughs> about your order. So can't fucking beat that, right? Excellent. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I think that's it. It was really nice chatting with you, man. What a, how, how fun that, we, that you were at my... That, that you were in the room the first day I met Municipal Waste. And like I said, what a pivotal day for me. And, and just that show at ABC No Rio, I'll never forget. And yeah, if you, if you come across those photos, you don't, you don't got to go digging for them now, but if you come across them, man, I'd love to see some photos from that day. It's just a really cool day. And it's been really nice talking to you, man. Thanks for inviting me on your show and letting me talk about, you know, what I do. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, Scotty.